I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the way in which the Jewish community remains transfixed on questions surrounding the Iran nuclear accord. On Friday, August 27th, the president sat with representatives of the Jewish Federations of North America and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. You may have seen JBS's exclusive live television coverage of the meeting, or you may have seen one of our retelecasts. Unfortunately, the overwhelming sentiment among viewers who were in touch with me after that session was enormous disappointment with the questions that were asked to the president. And I was very disappointed also. So while the president was very articulate, and if you came with no knowledge before the fact, the president did not have to answer any serious questions that were at the heart of the deal. The president looked very good, but he didn't have to answer any tough questions. Well, one very knowledgeable and thoughtful individual did suggest 10 crucial questions for the president to answer. And it's always a pleasure to welcome to JBS Robert Satloff, Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Robert, thank you for joining us again. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Robert, you did a fabulous job by outlining 10 areas you wish the president would be confronted with and have to deal with. You asked if the Iran deal bolsters the security of the Gulf states. Why do the Gulf states need more military help from the United States? You wanted to have the president asked, why is he not transferred to Israel? The MOP, Massive Ordnance Penetrators, the mountain busting bomb. You wanted to ask the president why he's refused to spell out penalties for Iranian infractions and violations. And uh, the most cogent question, it seems to me, that you wanted addressed, and it's the one I wanted to ha see him address, was the issue of what would Iran's nuclear capability be at the end of 15 years. And Robert, you, you know I'm sure that David Harris of the American Jewish Committee and the American Jewish Committee itself has come out against the deal. And I want to play for you and our audience a very, very short clip of David Harris giving the ultimate reason why he is opposed to the deal, and it's, it, it basically echoes one of the questions you wanted to ask. Here is David Harris explaining why he's against the deal. There is a certainty to the deal. And it's not an opponent of the deal who said it. It is the principal proponent of the deal who said it, the President of the United States. Maybe it was a comment that he subsequently regretted, but he said in an interview on NPR that within 13, 14, or 15 years, Iran will have no breakout time to a nuclear weapon. You point out in your questions this apparent contradiction that on the one hand the president said when he spoke to JFNA and the president's conference on Friday that in perpetuity Iran would be prevented from developing nuclear weapons grade uranium. But in his NPR interview he said it would be, David Harris says zero, actually what the president says in the NPR uh, interview is it would, it would be only two to three months. You ask him to clarify that discrepancy. That question was never asked, Robert. My question for you is, what do you feel the truth is? At the end of 13, 14, 50 years, 15 years, Robert Satloff, do you believe Iran will be at the same point it is now two to three months to zero? Or do you believe the president's comments that he made on Friday, that even though Iran will have peaceful nuclear uh, capability, in perpetuity, Iran will be prevented from having nuclear-grade uh, weapons capability? Well, uh, 
uh, I think the president himself, as you as you noted, answered this question with uh, great candor when he responded to the NPR interviewer um, in April, saying that Iran's breakout time will eventually be approaching zero. Um, uh, there has to be some implication to the expiration, the end of restrictions that are um, going to be placed on Iran for its centrifuges and its uh, enrichment. Those restrictions begin to end after uh, 10 years, um, and the situation at that point, by definition, has to be different than the situation before that point. I mean, to argue it is to, is, is to argue that there's no difference between night and day if the sun is apparent in one but not apparent in the other. Of course there's a difference. Now, you can argue that, um, uh, that we will uh, perhaps retain um, adequate um, uh, defenses, adequate means to stop Iran should we choose to do it, but you can't argue that the situation remains unchanged once um, the restrictions on Iran's use of advanced centrifuges and restrictions on its accumulation of rich uranium uh, disappear. Robert, this is such a critical issue at the heart of people's concern about the deal. I want to give the president now every opportunity to respond. In essence, I want to play, again, as a very brief clip. These are the words the president uttered during Friday's conference, and then I want to ask you a question about them. Sloan, let's see those, that clip. Uh, this deal is designed to essentially put Iran in the penalty box for the first 15 years, where even its peaceful nuclear program is severely constrained. After 15 years, assuming they've abided by that deal, they can then start opening up their peaceful nuclear program, but their prohibition on weaponizing nuclear power, that continues in perpetuity. Robert, the president is making a distinction between peaceful nuclear program and weaponized nuclear program. He says that all, all he ever meant was that for 15 years, Iran would be limited even in, in, even in its peaceful nuclear program, but that it will be forever limited in its weaponized nuclear program. Do you accept that distinction? Every country is limited in its weapons program. It is against every country. Uh, it is against the, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty for any signatory to pursue a nuclear weapon. So there's, this is no great shakes. This is not some uh, brilliant um, innovation of, uh, uh, of the Iran nuclear deal that suddenly Iran has acquired a prohibition on achieving a nuclear weapon. No, every country that has ever signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty um, has committed itself not to um, uh, build, acquire, develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, no, what is, what is, it's a bit of sleight of hand to make the argument that the president has made. Okay, um, so there's nothing specific in this agreement that would go beyond the general prohibitions of the Non-Proliferation no, Treaty. Let me, let me be precise. There are certain aspects of this agreement which do uh, differentiate Iran from other countries. Uh, they're not the ones that would be um, uh, definitive in preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So, for example, uh, this agreement um, does uh, contain um, a, uh, a monitoring mechanism on uh, Iran's uranium mining industry for 25 years, which is a long time, much longer than the 10, 15 years. But that is different than the lifting of restrictions on advanced centrifuges which expire after 10 years. One cannot make the argument that, is Iran, that Iran is in the same situation after 10 years, that it will be after 15, that it will be after 20 or 25 can't make the argument mm -hmm. because there are dates in this agreement. 
Uh, and, the, and, and not only are there dates in this agreement, but those dates are not truly performance dependent. Mm-hmm. Um, we do not know, uh, this is another lacuna, another gap in the agreement, we do not really know what penalty Iran will suffer for um, uh, less than catastrophic violations of the agreement. Yes. For, for a catastrophic violation, you know, if, if somehow uh, Iran has been building a bomb that is discovered um, somewhere uh, in, uh, in its territory, I think we can rest assured that there will be the reimposition of um, UN and international sanctions. But for less than catastrophic violations, we simply do not know because none of that is spelled out in the agreement. And serial violations could have a huge impact. Um, if Iran nibbles away at the edges of this agreement, and there are a thousand and one ways in which you could do that, if it nibbles away at the edges of this agreement over the course of that 10 to 15 years, then the speed with which it could eventually achieve a nuclear breakout is in the blink of an eye. Yes. Well, I was disappointed that the question, and again, you wrote this question before the conference, with the meeting before the, before the meeting with the JFNA and the Conference of Presidents, I wish someone had asked the question basically as you outlined it. And I think that without that question being posed to the president, we really didn't learn anything, nor can those Jews who are struggling to come to their own position. It's impossible to do so. Um, how effective do you feel, Robert, the inspection process is and there you know nobody asked him what about the 24 warning day period iran gets what about the fact that iran is permitted to be the one to collect soil samples what about the fact that they're saying military installations are out of bounds in terms of the inspection process i'm asking you your your assessment of when a president says there's never been as stringent a verification process as we've built into this agreement, to what extent is it truly implementable? It may be the best ever. It still may not be good enough. And as you answer that question, Robert, explain to us what you believe America can or cannot see from the sky by American satellite systems. Well, you raise a, uh, a number of very important questions. Um, too many people uh, equate um, something being unprecedented with something necessarily being effective. Exactly. Uh, just because it is unprecedented doesn't at all mean that it is guaranteed to be effective. Right. So I think we should we should uh, um, we should attune our ears. Um, whatever somebody says something about this agreement that it's unprecedented, um, we should be uh, like yeah, waiting for the other shoe to drop because that only means that it never happened before, it doesn't mean that it's any good. Right. Now, it could be good. Yes. Um, and here uh, leads me to your second question. I have enormously high regard for the professionalism of the inspectors of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, what um, uh, The real gap in this agreement is not about their professionalism. It is that this is a political agreement. This agreement exists only via a handshake. Nothing is signed, nothing is initialed. All the requirements are not requirements, they're only voluntary commitments. It's a political agreement, and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the robustness and the, um, the depth of inspections will reflect more than anything else how the United States and its international partners are, are, are willing to go after Iranian possible transgressions. How frequently are they going to say, we think that's a suspect site, we want to look at it. We want to challenge you here, we want to challenge you there. Or will they be satisfied because the politics around this agreement are so sensitive and everyone is worried about whether the Iranians are going to chuck it all, will we restrain ourselves from uh, letting the inspectors do everything that inspectors should do? I think we're already seeing that with the the points you just raised about Parchin and um, the, uh, uh, the IAEA secret 
annex agreements with Iran on inspecting Parchin. Mm-hmm. I don't blame the IAEA here. I think the IAEA was put in an impossible position. Mm-hmm. They were essentially ordered by um, uh, the political powers that be to have this issue resolved in as inobtrusive and unproblematic a way as will still sp- pass inspection but not cause problems for the agreement. And that is what was produced. Um, uh, a very problematic, very secretive, untransparent approach to um, a, a very significant problem, um, the resolution of which is necessary to provide a baseline for judging all the rest of Iran's compliance with its uh, with the terms of this. Yes. Case. So um, um, I don't blame the IAEA. Yes. Um, I I think the responsibility here falls on the political leaderships that set the rules for this entire understanding. Okay. By the way, just as a side question, you understand how Washington works. Would it have been inappropriate for the JFNA and the President's Conference to ask the President such a specific question as, how can you tell us on the one hand that the breakout time is, is forever, when at the same time on NPR, you told an NPR reporter that it's two to three months to zero? Or why do you tell us that the inspection process is so wonderful, but they have 24 days to clean things up under certain circumstances, and they're the only ones who can collect the soil, and there are certain military installations that are off bounds? Would it have been appropriate, or would it have been some violation of protocol for those questions to have been asked? Well, um, my view is, uh, um, since the president has deemed uh, the decision on the Iran nuclear agreement to be uh, perhaps the most fateful foreign policy decision in more than a decade, that uh, no serious question um, is outside the pale. Good for you. And um, uh, I, uh, it is with great regret that um, that the uh, well, what I tweeted. It yes. appears that the questions were, uh, were vetted by the White House because only softballs were thrown. By the way, that's important. Do you think there were better or tougher questions which the president said he would not answer? Oh, I have, I have no idea whether this arose, rose to the level of the president. Um, uh, I would assume that this was, uh, you know, the, the various whole, uh, okay, I handlers and um, and. and public relations people around him, but uh, I, I can only assume that uh, we being, you know, Jews being a questioning people, yes. um, uh, that uh, they came up with um, far more pointed, direct, um, uh, probing questions um, than the ones that were eventually okay. proposed. To the well, we, if that's true, the question becomes for you and for me, should they have turned it down? In other words, but you know, Jane Eisner also did an interview with the president. She did better, but she didn't ask any of these specific questions, and I was disappointed in that respect also. Do you Look, think... I, my, my view is um, um, uh, one never turns down an opportunity to engage with the president of the United States on important issues such as this. Even if, you, time, even if you're at not... The same time, at the same time, uh, there is no reason... For for one to uh, to accept ground rules yes. for questioning yes. that deprive the event of real meaning for the listeners. Okay, I want to treat one more very important issue that you raised in your ten questions. You know, more and more very respected people on the left and on the right, Robert, seem to be saying that the U.S. and Israel are worse off if the deal is defeated in Congress. And they argue, as Jeffrey Goldberg also wrote, no deal means no constraints. And if the U.S. were to walk away from the deal, it would walk away alone. The U.S. would be out of the game, while Iran would continue on its merry way without formal U.S. oversight. And the question that the Jewish community has to answer for itself is, which situation is worse? Up till now, Robert, Whenever I hear Jews argue this point, they're arguing whether you should support or oppose the deal. I want to ask you for a nuance. 
assuming everyone opposes the deal, the question still needs to be asked. What's the best strategy in terms of the future well-being of the United States and the future well-being of the State of Israel? Is it better to defeat the deal in Congress and to work with Congress to try to lobby Congress to defeat the deal? Or perhaps as Dennis Ross at the Washington Institute says, or as Brent Skrokoff says, where Jeffrey Goldberg quotes this in his piece, it is better to accept the deal and lobby Congress in a different way, to lobby Congress to improve the deal by making sure the president commits himself now to giving you know, the mounting buster bomb to Israel and a way to deliver it and to specify the way in which the U.S. will react to any infractions, one of the things you raise in your questions, and that ultimately the emphasis should not be on defeating the deal because if you defeat the deal, it's worse, but the emphasis should be on forcing Congress to present the president with demands of, for him to strengthen U.S. response and U.S. aid to Israel in the context of the deal. Where do you stand on that issue? Uh, well, Mark, I, um, you just posed a very important, but I'm afraid complex and even more nuanced question than you may have uh, realized. And I'm not sure that, uh, in fact, you, you, uh, you accurately describe the views of everybody in that, uh, in that question. Um, Look, I'll tell you my view. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because other people can speak for themselves. Okay. Here's, here's my view. This is not a binary choice. Um, the president, both the, both the proponents and opponents of the deal, would like um, people to think this is a binary choice. Um, uh, up or down, yes or no, right or wrong, left or right. That's wrong, in my view. Um, uh, this deal can be, must be, improved now before it gets to a vote. And if it is not improved by the president before it gets to a vote, then Congress should use the only legal mechanism that it has to compel the president to consider improvements, which is then to vote no. You can vote no in the first round, and then there is another two weeks before the override vote in which um, the president could take more seriously the need to improve it. And if still by then... He has not uh, uh, accepted a comprehensive package of improvements, then you can still vote no, because the U.S. requirement to lift sanctions, um, if Iran fulfills its requirements, doesn't even kick in for another six to nine months. And I, be I don't believe at all the arguments that a no vote triggers either war on the one hand or the end to international sanctions on the other. I think both those arguments are totally wrong, unanalytical, un and have little basis in sound analysis. And so I think there is a lot of time in which the president could make the necessary changes unilaterally or, or with, uh, by agreement with our European allies that make this flawed agreement less flawed. Is it going to be a good agreement? Well, it'll be less flawed agreement. Um, uh, uh, and I think that is a legitimate goal. And if voting no is what is necessary to achieve it, then I don't think legislators should fear the implications of a no vote in order to achieve the benefits of a better deal. That is a fascinating analysis. By the way, I wish we had a long time and that we were sitting face to face so you could explain to me where you really think you're, that I am misquoting the people <laughs> who I did refer to. But I, I right now really basically quoted Jeffrey Goldberg in his article where he said the U.S. would be out of the game if they walked away. And, um, you know, the question is, do you believe, Robert, in the absence of an agreement that the U.S. could unilaterally prevent Iran from, I'm using now Jeffrey Goldberg's piece, crossing the nuclear threshold without going to war? Because ultimately, everybody watching you right now on JBS wants to know only one thing. Should we be pressuring Congress to block this deal? Or if we block the deal, 
have we made things worse for Israel and for the United States? You I just... do not believe, I'll tell you this, I do not believe that blocking this deal makes things worse for Israel or for the United States. Um, um, I believe that the, uh, that the fears expressed about implications of a no vote have been wildly exaggerated. Okay. Um, do you think, by the way, that if there were a no vote, the United States could bring Iran back to the negotiating table? I think that's uh, probably unlikely. It's not impossible, but I think it's unlikely. I mean, I hate to say it, but uh, um, uh, to answer this question, one has to one has to read closely both the deal and the governing legislation, the Iran Nuclear uh, Agreement Review Act, because even a no vote, and even an overwhelming no vote, doesn't kill the deal. This deal exists because the political leaders of the eight parties to it want it to exist. Would the, Question, United, Sta would the United States stay part of the deal if it said I think, no? Uh, I, I think there's a very strong likelihood that even if Congress voted this down, the president would try to find a way to maintain American participation and implementation of the agreement. And frankly, um, there are ways he could do it. This agreement does not negate America's support of the deal. This agreement does not negate America's vote at the Security Council endorsing the deal. All a no vote does, technically, it may have powerful symbolic value, but technically all it does is restrict, not deny or negate, but just limit the president's ability to waive certain nuclear sanctions um, that uh, would be waived several months from now. Um, if, he if he so chose, he could find other ways around that. That's right. And, we, and so, um, uh, you know, this is an argument. In, in, some, in some ways, this is a, um, a, uh, 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 an argument that um, the opponents of the deal don't want to hear because it means that they actually have no uh, true leverage to kill the deal. I, don't, I think there is very little leverage available to kill the deal. Mm -hmm. what, what can one do is one can... Uh, um, use the leverage that is available to to uh, to improve the deal, to make it a better deal. Um, I do believe there is a better deal out there. This is not a unicorn fantasy, um, uh, uh, but I also believe that uh, uh, tactically the administration has um, uh, set this up quite brilliant, brilliantly from their perspective, because oh. this is a deal that can't be killed. Yes, I just want to clarify one thing with you. When you say a better deal is possible. You don't mean a better deal with Iran. You mean that in terms of the way the United States sets it up, in terms of U.S. policy, there's a better way in, in, in which the U.S. can articulate its position. Do I have it no, correct? I, well, I would, I would go even further than that. This deal has within it many gaps and, uh, and holes. And how one fills these holes is very important. So, for example... Um, spoke about this earlier, let's say the whole about um, penalties for Iranian violations. The deal is silent on this. Well, the deal also creates a mechanism in which the eight um, parties to the deal form a committee that will determine what to do. Well, five of the eight would be the United States and its European partners. So if those five all got together today and um, announced that they have reached agreement that for, every, for different types of violations, there are going to be different types of penalties, you have filled in a very significant gap in the deal. Yes. Uh, so that's in the deal. It doesn't yes. have to be negotiated with the Iranians, um, uh, but it would be an element of the deal itself, not just the political environment around the deal. So it's both. It is um, a bolstering deterrence around the deal, uh, you know, sending the mop to Israel, that sort of thing. But it's also fixing flaws and gaps in the deal. Itself. Okay. But it's still basically working with the existing deal. Yes, Robert? Um, I find it very difficult at this point to imagine that this deal, that the text of this deal is going to be reopened by all of its uh, I, I agree. parties to it. Uh, okay. The reason I push you this way, I will tell you my concern, and I know you're in no way reluctant to tell me where you think I'm off base. <laughs> the question for me becomes, what is the obsession in the Jewish community today is the obsession to kill the deal because people who want to kill it, Robert, say 
If we kill it, Iran will have to come back to the table. I don't believe either of those are both possible or st strategically in anyone's interest. What I want to see the Jewish community focus on now are the things you have just enumerated, the things that we heard when we talked to Dennis Ross last week. There are ways that are critical for the flaws to be addressed inside the deal, and that if members of Congress are going to lobby the president, if members of Congress are going to say to the president, we are still undecided, you want us to be decided, we need certain things from the White House, that that's what the American Jewish community should be lobbying for now. We should be lobbying members of Congress, not to kill the deal, but to use your words to improve and fix the deal. To what extent are you comfortable with my analysis? Uh, well, um, uh, I, I hope you don't mind me saying that uh, um, uh, I have uh, a little bit of compunction trying to urge American Jews to do anything as American Jews. I, I, I prefer to urge American Jews to take action as, uh, as proud American citizens. Um, and uh, uh, my view is, if any legislator asks me, it is, if you think that the advantages of this deal substantially outweigh the disadvantages, vote for it. If you think the disadvantages substantially outweigh the advantages, vote against it. And if you think you can improve the deal, use the leverage that you have. And the only way you use leverage is by threatening the administration to vote against it and maintaining that position until you get a better deal. Okay. So I won't ask you what you think American Jews should do. What should Americans do? Well, that's what I said. That's, what, that's exactly what they should tell their legislators. There's a way to get a better deal, and the only way you're going to get a better deal is if the administration believes um, uh, that, uh, uh, that it has to make these concessions to achieve it. And the yes, only way but they believe that yes. is if they fear a no vote. I, I agree 100%. I'm only saying that I think a legislator has a better chance of arguing their case with the White House if what they're asking the president to do is improve the deal, not coming to the White House and saying, we're simply going to scuttle the whole thing. Do you disagree with me? I, I think that's correct. Okay. It is always wonderful to talk to you. And I mean, you know, we have now turned to the Washington Institute over and over again to you specifically, but also members who are working with you. You're doing fabulous work, and the fact that you always make yourself available in a very, very hectic schedule means so much to me, not because of me, but because what you have to say, Robert, is so critical for America to hear. And I'm very proud of the fact that JBS not only talks to American Jewry, but many, many non-Jews watch us and are contacting us and, and care about what we are able to bring to the public airwaves. So I thank you very, very much, and I will continue to chase you. <laughs> okay, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank I mean you very, that. very much. You're welcome. The thoughts of Robert Satloff, who again is the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And he is nuanced, but you, it is clear what's coming through the nuance, and that there are many things that trouble him about the deal. He agrees that if questions are going to be asked to the president by the Jewish community, the questions, he understands, they're always going to be vetted. But that one has a right, one has a right in America to ask the president of the United States the really tough questions. By the way, I am still hoping, I'm hoping that perhaps the president of the United States will sit with me for a half hour and let me ask him these kind of questions. We have addressed this to the White House. JBS is still new. We're somewhat small. I don't know if the president will feel we're large enough for him to take his time, for his taking his time to sit with us. But who knows? It is my hope that we will continue to bring you as much information as possible. And mark down on your calendar that this Wednesday night, September 2nd, from 7 to 9 p.m., this Wednesday night, We'll be going live with a live telecast in which we will be discussing all of the issues related to the Iran nuclear deal and 
It's 7 to 9 p.m. to be sure I do have a chance to take your phone calls. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, the associate director of JBS, Dara Golub, to our producer for this edition of In the News. Wonderful job, Carol, to Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.